Uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, I'm sure you're joining us from many different locations, uh, from around the Philippines and including from Spain, where I understand Professor Luengo, it is six in the morning there. So thank you for joining us at this early hour. Um, welcome, everyone in general. Welcome to panel B, session six. Uh, this morning's panel was on Mindanao and Southeast Asia. The, this afternoon's panel is 16th century Southeast Asian culture. Uh, I am Nicholas C. I am an assistant professor with the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and I'll be your moderator for this panel. Uh, we're currently live in almost 100 Facebook pages, so um, I hope uh, that is uh, uh, our, 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 our presentations are broadcasted very broadly. Uh, it will be broadcasted from primarily from the Philippine Centennial Committee, the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, and other foreign service posts, as well as the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. Um, we are joined today by, by our two uh, speakers, uh, Professor Archil Daoud from MSU, who will be our first speaker. And uh, our second speaker this afternoon will be Professor Pedro Luengo from the Universidad de Sevilla. So, uh, without further ado, we are going to begin with our first session. And so I will introduce Professor Archil uh, Daou. Uh, so Professor Archil is uh, an alumni of MSU. He finished his BA there and he has two master's uh, degrees. One is a master's in history with MSU and a second is a master of arts in anthropology with the University of San Carlos. Um, he is currently assistant professor with the Department of History at MSU and he has uh, published research in the International Journal of Cultural and History and the Mediterranean Journal of social sciences. He is also uh, one of the organizers of the National Seminar on Teaching the Rizal course, uh, which is uh, very important to our um, new curriculums on how to uh, uh, teach Rizal in history. He has also presented in a, a variety of events in uh, Capital University and in MSU, as well as in the Visayas, Visayas um, State University and the University of San Carlos, as well as participated in uh, vi various important um, commissions uh, on culture and history. So uh, Professor uh, Daug's presentation today will be talking about Also about love and also about philosophy. So without further ado, uh, we welcome Professor Dao. Uh, thank you for that introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I actually prepared a uh, PowerPoint presentation, which is very, very short because uh, I was under the impression that I'm supposed to be giving a lecture. And so I prepared a lecture. So I'll be reading a lot. Uh, However, uh, the research that I've made uh, was actually a, uh, uh, or most of it is a product of my undertakings together with the Higaonan, uh, an indigenous community in Iligan City. So uh, Iligan City is in the north part of uh, the island of Mindanao. Uh, if you're not familiar with the map, um, I'm not going to present the uh, uh, our point anymore. I would just go directly into the lecture. Uh, but uh, as I've said, my uh, engagement with the Higaonan has been going on ever since 2012. Many of them uh, have become my friends. Some of them almost treated like families. Um, yeah, so uh, all the details regarding the Higaonan would be coming from uh, that ethnography. Uh, that started so many years ago, still continuing even today. I did have the uh, uh, FDIC from the um, NCIP uh, only in last year, 
2020. Uh, a little bit ironic as some of the anthropologists probably already experienced uh, that we've already built connections uh, with communities before um, you know FPIC was even uh, asked for by the NCIP. Well, anyway, I will try to uh, start now. So my topic would be love and mama. Mama is uh, composed of uh, nareka nut, a betel leaf, and lime, and sometimes tobacco. Uh, you place all the materials inside the betel leaf, and then chew it. Uh, take the juices in, uh, chew the quid. Uh, and then when it's no longer uh, giving off juices, you just spit it. Uh, it gives the, the, the mouth uh, a very red uh, texture. Uh, some stories would say uh, it's almost like blood red. So that will be my topic today. Uh, contrary to the earlier posters, I will not be talking about death and human sacrifice. Instead, I will be talking about love. Uh, well, let me begin with a Vietnamese story involving the main ingredients of the betel quid. Uh, the betel leaf, the areca nut, and the lime. Twin brothers fell in love with the same woman, but tradition dictated that the older of the two should marry first. So the older one ended up marrying her. However, there came a time when the woman confused between the twin brothers. She showed her affection to the younger one, most of this by accident. Filled with remorse, the younger of the twins fled to a far-flung place across the river and died. Uh, on the spot where he died, a slender tree bearing nuts in the shape of a heart sprang out. The concerned older brother went after his missing brother, he got very tired and decided to take a rest. By a twist of fate, he rested on the slender tree which grew from the spot where his brother died. He too must have suffered the same exhaustion and died in the same spot, then turned into a block of limestone. The wife followed the journey of her husband, but weariness and despair conquered her. She collapsed on the same spot where her husband died. She became a betel vine that crept and twined around the limestone. In another version of the story, still from Vietnam, it was the younger brother that turned into a limestone lying by the riverside after weeping till death and it was the older brother who died of exhaustion and was transformed into an areca tree. In this second version, the wife reached the same spot, leaned against the tree and died, transformed into a plant with large frequent leaves climbing on the areca tree. Hearing of this tragic love story, Local inhabitants in the area set up a temple to their memory. Their version continues, One day, King Hung went by the site and gained knowledge of the story from local people. He ordered his men to take and ground together a leaf of betel, an areca nut, and a piece of lime. A juice as red as human blood was squeezed out from the melange. He tasted the juice and found it delicious. Then he recommended the use of betel chewed, betel chewed along with a nut and lime at every marital ceremony. From this time on, chewing betel became a custom for the Vietnamese and every often they began their conversation with a quid of betel. In a version of Myanmar, the flow of the story remained the same, albeit there are nuances as to how the mistaken romance started. There were twins who fell in love with the same woman. The woman married the older of the twins, but there were instances where she mistook the younger brother as her husband. There was friction in the household, and the conscientious younger brother left, almost the same with uh, the version in Vietnam, but later died of exhaustion and was transformed into a white stone that symbolized his purity. 
The older brother looked for the missing brother and suffered the same fate. When he died of exhaustion in the same stone, he became an areca tree. The wife followed and soon died in the same spot. She became a vine clinging to the tree. Later, a villager discovered how to use the areca nut, the betel leaf, and the lime. The villager told his king that he discovered something there. And as a true reward, the king uh, knew of the story out of that villager. And as a true reward of their true love, it was officially announced that betel leaf, the areca nut, and limestone must be present at the arms and wedding ceremonies in Myanmar. There is a simpler tale about love and betel quid showing coming from Cambodia. The symbolical use of betel in Cambodia can be traced to a legendary prince, Prathong, who marries a serpent princess. She gives the princess a betel quid as a pledge of her trust, and since this time, betel has been used to bond relationships in Cambodia. This is also reflected in Indonesia. Reed explains that the most characteristic roles of betel in the Indonesian world and well beyond it, however, were in the rituals of courtship and marriage. The offering and acceptance of betel was so much identified with courtship and betrothal that compounds, compounds of the Malay word for areka, binang, have passed into modern vocabulary on this subject. But one of the highlights of the stories is the transition from romantic love to a much more universal one. Rooney explained that the main reason for chewing betel seems to lie in the social affability produced by sharing a quid with friends. This enjoyment can be seen on the faces of a group of elderly men squatting around a betel box or herd in field with a betel basket. Offering a quid to someone is a mark of hospitality. It was this social significance of betel quid chewing that the Europeans missed in trying to explain why Southeast Asians have a penchant for chewing betel quid. Rooney's narrative on betel quid chewing traditions in Southeast Asia enumerated several accounts by Europeans. This includes an account by Epigafeta about the Philippines in 1521. He noted that, the noted that those people are constantly chewing a fruit which they call areca and which resembles a pear. They cut that fruit into four parts and then wrap it in the leaves of their tree they call betel. betel. Those leaves resemble the leaves of the mulberry. They mix it with a little lime and when they have chewed it thoroughly, they spit it out. It makes the mouth exceedingly red. All the people in those parts of the world use it, meaning Southeast Asia, for it is very cooling to the heart. Although in the Philippines, Bigafetta would say, if they cease to use it, they would die. I don't know if that's true. An account by a certain P.A. Thompson, a 19th century Thailand, attempted to explain brittle with chewing in, according to Rooney, an equally absurd idea. According to Thompson, old and young all chew the betel nut. This is really the nut of the areca palm, which is cut up and wrapped together with a little tobacco in a leaf of the betel vine, first smeared with a pink mixture of lime and turmeric. The quid is stuffed away in the cheek, and, and this is the crazy part, the reason for it is to produce the pure Siamese accent. This is how the Europeans, uh, at the point of contact, when they realize that uh, Southeast Asians are uh, obsessed with uh, betel quid chewing, that they try to explain it based on their observations, and most of them never really explained it in the way the natives would have. However, through the years, betel quid chewing in Southeast Asia is well documented. It's not my intention to review them one by one here or some in some generic form. 
Though it is important to note that when I was researching about betel quid chewing, many articles on health, especially about cancer, came up. But this is another matter. How the quid started in Southeast Asia is already lost. This is because of the genius nature of packing together three ingredients to be distributed plants, while the third is relatively ubiquitous. It is the quid's function in social relations that is unquestionable. Ellen, talking about betel quid chewing among the Nualu people of Indonesia, explained that the obviousness of betel quid chewing is only broken when non-Nualu visitors are offered the quid. Meaning, because most of the Nualu people chew the quid, it is often unremarkable within them, in, in a sense of what Rooney mentioned as the social affability produced by sharing a quid with friends. It has become too normal that there's really nothing overly significant about it that would somehow create so much attention. The real social meaning of the quid is only manifested with offering it to a visitor because what is offered is not just literally the quid, but mutual trust and friendship. Again, for some reason, the Europeans had a difficult time figuring this one out, this one out when they first encountered petal quid chewing in Southeast Asia. Let me go back a bit to the stories of love presented above. This is still a lecture about love after all. There are a, a lot to learn from these stories and I am going to elaborate some ideas as a student of the teachings of Jacques Lacan, the, the 21st century French psychoanalyst, uh, the most noticeable uh, flow of the story, especially that from Vietnam and Myanmar, is the repetition of occurrences of journeying to the point of exhaustion and then dying. This was repeated three times in those versions. The repetition revolves around the missing other. The first, the younger brother, then the older brother, and then the wife. A feature of culture is its sublime object and a continuous revolution around this object. In other words, there is an ideal that this repetition revolve around, and that ideal, in the case of these stories, is love. It is perhaps not a coincidence that in the same seminar where Lacan expounded his interpretation of the unconscious and the repetitive tendency of culture and the drive that he finished it with love. The anchor point of the repetition in the stories, the point that grounds them and that which enables the repetition in the first place is love. But love is not easy to define in actual life. It is not an actual object of desire that can be accessed. We can follow the supposed aim for it, but we can never have it as, as a kind of object. When we are in love, we see in the other something more than the other, perhaps even driven by a force we cannot understand. What this something is, we cannot explain. The best thing we do is to beat around the bush in relation to it, under, for example, in such contextualization like a temple for the lovers, the symbolization of their deaths as objects, the honor of a king to transform the tragedy into a victory, or a gift from a serpent princess. These objects are semblances of the sublime object. I will no longer have the space nor the time to develop the function of love in this repetition, but it suffices to say that these stories do not only manifest the compulsion to repeat, but that it is culture itself that crowns this repetition in the form of a temple on one hand, and in the form of tradition on the other. Whatever were the circumstances of the birth of betel quid chewing in Southeast Asia, it no longer matters. The second point that I am going to describe a little bit revolves around the fact that the entire affair was based on something missing and the operation towards a sublime object. Lacan's famous contribution to the study of the human psyche, Le Objet Petit A, or the object cause of desire, or more appropriately, the missing organ that makes us incomplete. There are basic Lacanian notions. In the presence of the missing object, 
the object small a, we are always broken and barred from being complete. The notion of a barred subject points to two ideas. First, that the subject is split at the zero level between being and the nothingness that the missing object produces in us. And second, that we can never be whole again, forever barred until death, and that the continuous approach to the missing object can, just as it is repetitively told in the story, lead to our death. This is the message of the three ingredients that complement together to form the quid. The stories set this message up, the three ingredients clinging together in an expression of love. They treat each other, albeit only in death. Let this not depress anyone. What this means is that if we have a sublime object functioning like a tempting sun behind a horizon, and a horizon that we always approach, we always have a live. Lastly, the more important part of the story is the transformation of what can seemingly denote household affair into something universalized within culture. This is no longer just a tragedy. It is the origin of a custom for the Vietnamese or Myanmar or Cambodian peoples. One can see the dialectic in this one. I am of course referring to an interpretation of Hegel by Zizek. Love is an anchor point in Battle Quit Shoeing, a forbidden affair that contradicts the established norms transcended towards the very ideals of love, that instead of turning the story into a moral story of what should be forbidden must be forbidden, it was instead celebrated as a prime example of love and sacrifice. Those who have heard the story were encouraged to partake in love eternally. If we are to be Hegelian about it, we only look at the journey that love endured in order to disappear in the gray mist of the universal, within which our Southeast Asian philosophers must have painted their gray on gray, the death of the lovers understood not by the misery of the past, but by the power of tradition. Lurking in the stories is the presence of royalty, from which the owl of Minerva spreads its wings at the setting of dusk. And this is where Betel Quid Chewing also garnered a kind of rep. Sorry, Professor Dalog, I think uh, you've accidentally muted yourself. Okay. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, you're audible now. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, the agent of history is a powerful figure, uh, for example, a king, or that villager, or a ruler, which, through the cunning of reason, realizes this dialectic, the, the turning of love into something uh, universal. The point, really, of this section is not merely to reiterate how widespread battle with chewing was in Southeast Asia, but also that there is a considerable number of social practices involved with it. When the Europeans came into the region, they had a hard time trying to understand why many people are obsessed with metal quid showing, and they somehow completely missed the mark in attempting to interpret its cultural value. As the story themselves show, there is more, there's more to metal quid chewing than the very repetitive act of chewing. It's almost ubiquitous presence in the life ways of Southeast Asian communities even before the arrival of the Europeans, and that this presence is related to social relationships, bonding, connection, trust, and friendship is something worthy of memory. As mentioned in Tigafeta's account, the Philippine Islands is not a stranger to battle quit chewing. There are several accounts in the Blair and Robertson collection alone, and much more than uh, when anthropologists started examining the archipelago. Just as its Southeast Asian neighbors, the Philippines' betel quid chewing is a very important aspect in the native life ways at the point of European contact in 1521. The relation of Father Juan de Placencia to his order, written in 1589 regarding the worship of the Tagalogs, their gods, and their burials and superstitions, reported that the Tagalogs 
offer sacrifices to their gods, and that it included the placing of a few buyos, which is a small fruit wrapped in a leaf with some lime, a food generally eaten in these regions. One can ponder upon the situation of the Spaniards or the Europeans in general, who arrive in the region to find people who already develop betel quid chewing as a significant aspect of their respective cultures. At least in the Philippines, records show that the Spaniards were not able to resist their curiosities and participated in what many of them testified as a very healthy practice. According to Antonio Morga, the quid is so strong a mixture and burns so much that it induces sleep and intoxication. However, it strengthens and preserves the teeth and gums from all inflammations, decay, and aches. Those who chew the quid tell other wonderful effects of it. What has been seen is that the natives and Spaniards, laymen and religious, men and women, use it so commonly and generally in mornings and afternoons, at parties and visits, and even alone in their houses. All the refreshments and luxuries consist of boyos served on healthy gilded and handsomely adorned plates and trays like chocolate in Nueva Espana. In 1640, Fray Diego Aduarte related that even some of the Spaniards in this country very commonly use it, though they do not swallow it, so that only the juice reaches the stomach. It invigorates the stomach and preserves the teeth. A concise description of the quid and its effects is found in an undated and unsigned relation by a religious who lived in the Philippines for 18 years, which, according to the Reverend Father Pablo Pastels, was written by Father Diego de Bobadilla in 1640. According to this account, the buyo is used every very commonly among the Indians, both Christians and Mahometans, and even among the Spaniards. A mixture is made of it, which is called mamuin, into which three things enter. One is this leaf, which is called buyo, which is smooth and resembles in color and size a large ivy leaf, but it is not so thick. It smells very good and is aromatic. It is planted under some dry tree on which it climbs. The other fruit that enters into that mixture is called bonga, and it is as large as an olive. Lastly, they mix in a small quantity of quicklime. A little cornucopia is made of the leaf. The bonga and lime are placed inside, and it is all chewed together. The mixture colors the saliva red as blood, and the lips the most beautiful vermilion ever seen. It preserves the teeth, strengthens the stomach, and produces a very good breath. This preparation of the quid was also later observed by Fieco Procol among the Bukidnon and the Bagobo. An interesting account by William Henry Scott about the use of the quid in the Visayas mentioned that the preparation, exchange, and serving of betel nut was the most important social act among the Visayans. Men carried the necessary ingredients with them in little baskets or pouches, ready to share segments of the same nut, kulo, and thus become kakulo with another, an essential relationship before beginning any discussion or business. For a householder to fail to offer betel nut to anyone who entered his house was an insult inviting enmity. On formal visits, the quids were prepared and served in valuable metal trays or boxes by females of the household, slaves, daughters, or the lady herself, depending on the social standing of the guest. The Panay epic of Umadapnon climaxes, climaxes with a 62-line description of betel not being prepared and served by Binocot maidens. A special honor was to add a touch of musk or a slice of cinnamon bark or some other aromatic flavoring. Betel nut also figured in romance and courtship. To offer a quid partially chewed, called this one upa, was an act of flirtation. To send one in response to a man's clandestine request was an acceptance of his advances. To send it 
unbidden and open invitation. Thus, just as the neighboring islands, betelquid chewing runs far deeper into the cultures of communities in the Philippines. It is used in rituals, in social gatherings, and interactions, and of course, in love and romance. I must now shift attention to a more specific community in the Philippines, namely Gigolan, who resides in Barangay Rubongan in Iligan City. It is considerably a remote area found in the hills surrounding the eastern portion of the city. The Higaonon tribe is considered as one of the city's resident indigenous tribes. Though they are sporadically found in Barangay Rubongon, most of them have residences in Sitio Poblacion, the center of the barangay activities. Before and even during the Spanish period, the Higaonon were already establishing communities in the area that became Iligan and later Iligan. According to Almario, many of the names of the old barangays in the city used Higaonon terms. The origin of the world, according to the Higaonon, came in stages. First is the actual creation of the three personas of the Magbabaya, their god, Nangadin, Luminimbag, and Nananghag. In the process, the first humans, Nataniag and Natanghaga, were created. Neither was man or woman. In the beginning, the material world, called Lumpad, and the spiritual world, called Baya, were very close. It was said that there was once a tree, the Kalintubo, in the Baya that kept the early humans almost immortal. However, they were to eat the fruits of this tree only when necessary and not to harvest them or keep them for themselves. When the first humans disobeyed, the Magbabaya decided to lift the Baya out of the reach of the humans. This was the first split, which resulted to a period of chaos that was characterized by the prevalence of incest and great disorder. It was said that as the distance between the Baya and the Numbad grew, a Higaonan child was heard crying. Even today, the Higaonan performs the Malinka during festivals to comfort the child. Eventually, the Magbabaya needed to bring order to the world, thus the coming of Batasan Adamsil, which saw the emergence of leaders such as the Bailan, an almost Hi, priestly medium that connects the Baya with the Lumpad. Also, Hi, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Po. The Dagu and the Bai the Higaonan political leaders, and the bringing of order. Here, the Gantanan, both the concept and the object itself, and the ingredients of the Mama, were given during the first gathering of tribal leaders. The first experience of this symbolic battle with chewing was with the Apo Pamula and the man that became known in Higaonan as Castilla Hagabat Naupari Langit, or the Castilian priest was taken to the heavens. The materials included the bunga or the arecana, the buyo, the betel leaf, and apho or the lime, and the tobacco. The ingredients of the betel quid arrived together with batasan adansil. This emergence of the batasan adansil can be considered as an anchor point based on which cultural elements receive interpretation, roughly synonymous to a set of ethical code the Batasan Adansil is typically understood as the way things uh, wait, should uh, wait be. Wait lang po ma'am, kasi ano ko na, hindi parang, ang tawag dito, yung picture lang yung makikita. Hindi po yung kung anong, uh, kung anong gamit na app siya naka-open. Wait lang po. Very good ka dyan, na naisip mo, ikahapon kasi yan yung observation ko eh. Yun ma'am, kaya nagtatry ako ngayon ma'am na hindi nilalabas yun. Oh, 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 the idea is that a higaonon always weighs situations to keep ginagawa. This determines social relations, relations with deities, and with nature itself. 
The establishment of this unwritten law serves as a point of reference that retroactively affected the interpretation of the and culture. In this note, there was at that time nothing really new about betel quid chewing because they already knew how to make it and what to do with it. But the emergence of the Batasan Adansil as an anchor point transformed this contingent element in culture as something universally necessary. This change in perspective is reflected in the way how chewing the quid can somehow open a different kind of gaze in which a cover on one's eyes are lifted in order to see what was normally unseen. Chewing the quid also has the power to strip someone of any impurities. Batasan Adansil made it possible to establish a little connection between the material world of Lumbad and the spiritual realm of the Baya. Through it, a kernel of the spiritual realm can still be felt in the material world. This cultural act of inscribing a universal meaning to a contingent cultural activity turned an old practice into a new sanctified tradition. It is in the spirit that we may interpret Mama as being in the same position that love occupies in the stories mentioned earlier. If we are to take Freud literally when he said that the aid of technology, with the aid of technology, human beings have become prosthetic gods, then perhaps we can consider the betel quid as part of the Higaonon prosthesis. They consider its importance in the day-to-day -day labor, especially in the form. Many mention that they cannot farm without it. This is because of the perceived strength that the mama can provide just as the Apu Pamula only had to eat once a week because of the strength the mama provided. In a farming community like the ones found in Barangay Rugoman, working in the field was hard labor, and the mama is interpreted as having the capacity to reinvigorate the body. Apart from this role in farming, the mama can also be found in rituals and prayers. The presence of the ingredients of mama in rituals is called hangin, the proof of the purity of the heart by those calling the mababai. This sacredness projected to the mama and its power to clean an individual meant that the mama too is used in healing. One of the most important aspects of mama, however, is how it is attached to the concept of ginagawa. The Bailan explained, why ginagawa? This is one of the ginagawa. For example, in happenstance, we meet by the road, and we are not acquaintances, but you see me doing the mama. My mouth is red. He'll then say, what have you got there? Do you have nuts to share? And then I'll say, what do you lack in the four of them? What do you need? Then he'll say, I don't have some nuts, but I have the buyo. This is ginagawa, sharing. That's important. This is the sign that the man is really following the will of the Magbabaya. Both are united in it and therefore understands each other. This sense of sharing is considered one of the elements of Ginagawa. The Bailan added, even if we cannot feed our friends and siblings, as long as we can offer them Mama, this is the sign that we are a source of love and compassion. This is it sharing and giving life to everyone, what one can eat, others can partake too. The act of sharing and receiving is determined by how much a Higaonan knows his or herself in relation to others. The Higaonan therefore must learn to associate with others, and this association was considered more valuable than the objects exchanged. In Batasan Adansil, the exchange objects are themselves meanings that imply community. Friendship or acquaintances are important for the Gantangan. Socialization. You must socialize with everyone. You must be respectful to others. That is Ginagawa. This is why the spirit of community observed in people socializing together with the quid at the center of their activities means Ginagawa. This eventually answered a, an early curiosity of mine when I first became curious of what the mama meant for, for the datu and the bailan, the reply was always ginagawa. 
I need to include here the Lacanian notion of social link, which is based on the idea that any form of individuality is at the bottom line still a product of social interaction. Without the constitutive difference brought upon by the comparison of oneself with others, there can never really be a sense of individuality. The Higaon and Ginagawa is a good example of this. The worth of a person is not something hidden in some mysterious depths in the human psyche. On the contrary, it is found in plain sight, in social links, in human interactions. The reason why any discourse on mama usually ends up with ginagawa is found in the concept of sharing, sharing stories and sharing materials. I see this every time I visit any Higaonu community. It is an expression of their connection with one another. The Batasan Adansil is based on social links. The reason, however, that I revolve around Ginagawa in this last few minutes is that the root word of Ginagawa is Gagaw, and Gagaw means love. We have come full circle, I think, a circumnavigation, perhaps. I started with a tragic love story that placed Eros and Thanatos in the same line, anchored only by the battle quid as part of tradition in Southeast Asia. And this tradition was something that some Europeans have trouble explaining, even if it did not stop Hi, them from participating. At least we know the Spaniards did. No this Southeast Asian tradition includes oh, the and we see it yes, from yes, Spanish yes. accounts and the okay, later um, accounts of the When you're ready, check lang in natin the yung, yung video. In the present video, City, we yes, see yes, this tradition still. And it is as if from start Thank to you. finish, from the affability mentioned by Rooney in looking at Betel Quid showing traditions in Southeast Asia to the Ginagawa in Higaonu culture, we revolve around love. It will not hurt to mention Lako for one last time. His infamous claim that love makes up for the absence of the sexual connection rings true in the Southeast Asian tradition of battle with chewing. The message is simple. Because there is no natural law involving social relationships, we created one for ourselves. In lieu of sexual relations, relations that exist in nature only in terms of reproduction and the propagation Good afternoon. I am honored and privileged to welcome love. Professor Rudd. What love is, I leave to you. It is the point of its universality that made an appearance here today. All I know is that we create bonds in many circumstances, and these bonds should be the victory of humanity. Is it not the case that love itself is a prosthesis with which we become prosthetic gods? That's it for us. Thank you. Thank you for these reflections, Professor Dell. It's very interesting. And I've listed my questions, and I hope the audience has too. Uh, just a reminder that your questions, uh, kindly place them in the Q&A so that we can go through them during the open forum, or you can place them in the chat as well. So we now move to our second speaker, uh, Professor Lubango, um, who, uh, who is here with us. Uh, professor Lubango is Associate Professor of History of, History of Art at the um, He's associate professor at the at the History of Art Department uh, of the Universidad de Sevilla. Uh, he received his PhD in History of Art from this institution with his work Intramuros, Arquitectura in Manila, 1739 to 1788. And I think this is uh, this particular book is actually uh, has come out in print in 2012. No? Uh, he's been a visiting academic at different in international institutions, such as San Agustin Museum in Manila, Instituto de Investigaciones Estéticas in Mexico, the European University Institute in Florence, and uh, the King's College in London, Oxford University, and Sapienza Universita de, de Roma. He has also taken part in several international research projects, uh, being the principal investigator of one on uh, Siyang Lo buildings in the Yuanming Yuan Garden in Beijing, and another on the architecture of power during the 18th century. He has published several papers in journals, both national and international, uh, along with uh, a set of um, 
edition of his books, uh, one of which based on his dissertation, another entitled Manila Plaza Fuerte, Ingenieros Militares entre Europa, America y Asia, uh, published by CISIC, which is the National uh, Research Institute in Spain, along with the Ministry of Defense in Spain. And finally, Conventos de Manila, Globalized Architecture during the Iberian Union, which is published by Ateneo de Manila University Press in 2017. So uh, without further ado, we uh, welcome Professor Luango to give us his uh, lecture on urban organization in early modern Philippines. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to to present to give the presentation about uh, a topic that I think it is very important for uh, both the uh, Spanish and Philippine scholars because we are dealing with the basis of the 16th century culture, which has been usually explained as uh, a Spanish imposition, and I think this is something that might be uh, reviewed. Um, thank you very much for the, the great organization of a really uh, surprising amount of presentation and I, of a very uh, good level. And I hope to, to keep this level during the early presentation for me. Uh, but I think that it, it, it was important to discuss uh, in detail. Well, my, my presentation is below between the laws of the Indies and the laws of the Indians, an initial approach to urban organization in early modern Philippines. What I'm trying to, to, to prove, or what, what I will try to, to show here with several historical maps, is that uh, we should review this generalized idea that the Spaniards arrived in, uh, in, the, in Southeast Asia specifically in, in the Philippines, and imposed the Spanish Greek. The several scholars have named this the, the tyranny of the Spanish Greek. And from this perspective, uh, the foundation or the three configuration of cities, such as uh, Amoanga, Cebu, Bigan, Manila, are explained from this perspective. Uh, mm, this is something that you can find in many uh, books, in many uh, geographic traditions, that uh, in history, if you repeat something that is wrong many times, is it still wrong, or is that, or at least we should review it in detail, comparing the information we have, historical information we have, uh, both for the Philippines and for other uh, Settlements, both in Southeast Asia or in uh, or in America. So this is what I want you to, to do. First, focusing on the biggest cities at this time in the Philippines: uh, Manila, Cebu, Zamboanga, and Bigan. And uh, later, uh, using the same approach for several little villages uh, far from this capital just to underline that this cultural dialogic uh, process of reorganizing the urban space can be followed also in little villages, or even better, in little villages. Well, I would like to start not with Manila, but with Samoanga, uh, because it, well, the Spanish is somehow organized by Mindanao, and probably the connection between what is done in the south in, in Samoanga, and uh, what is done in the capital can be misunderstood because if we go to, 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 the, to Manila, we can think that the Spanish population there, who was much um, more numerous, uh, could define a uh, Spanish city. I, I'm going to speak both about Manila, Intramuros, and the outskirts. So I preferred to start with Samoanga because, as you know, it is a, a foundation prior to the Spanish arrival. Uh, this is clear, although we don't know too much, at least I don't know too much about the previous uh, urban uh, display of this city. But the interesting thing is that most of the uh, plans that we have 
uh, are insane or Amwanga are not widely known in, in the Philippines as, as far as I know. So this is the first one, the oldest I wanted to, to show you. This is a late 18th century map done and made by a, a great painter, uh, Francisco Brambilla, who will do also uh, a profile of, the, of this same village city. Uh, and in this map, we can see that we have a, a fort in one of the corners of the, of the settlement, uh, a little, probably this is not very well represented, uh, a little village inside the walls uh, border. That, for me, the most interesting thing is how the local population is displayed outside the sport along two, one, two big streets without any crossroads uh, in parallel to the coast. Uh, even at this time, it is clear in the Spanish sources that this was not organized by the Spanish authorities. This is native population organizing themselves, uh, occupying the space as they preferred. So this is the one of the first cases where we can see uh, uh, the, which are the, the, the urban uh, pattern that local population without any Spanish uh, influence are trying to use in urban, uh, in urban organization. This is very similar. I will be very quick here. This can be found in the Philippines, in different islands, but also in other parts of Southeast Asian uh, settlements. So this is the idea that, uh, uh, and this was the, the most common way of organizing urban space for uh, native population. <clears throat> if we go to the profile, we'll see how this is, how this Amboanga was. We will see that uh, houses are somehow distances one from another. This was already published by Scott uh, from Spanish sources. And this is far from the Spanish ideal, which is uh, published in the laws of the uh, one thing before, uh, before going farther about what is written in the laws of it, because this is probably the first problem uh, in, uh, in the interpretation of the Philippine cities and also in the American one. The ordinances, well, there is a, a publication in the, in the late 16th century where the, the king is uh, making recommendations something close to a law about how the new foundation should be. All the info, all the, the all these recommendations, maybe all of them, are only about main square. Which building and which are the dimensions of this main square? There is almost nothing about the streets, the rest of the streets of the city, and there is nothing directly nothing about the blocks. So how the blocks, how the, uh, even the orientation, how all, everything that had been said, even the definition of the grid is not included in the laws of English at any point. So uh, you can, uh, from the mm, recommendations given by the laws of English, you can uh, organize a good variety of cities with many differences. This is what we have in the 16th century from a legal perspective. If you go to America and you see how the cities were uh, organized from the urban perspective, you will see a wide variety of options. You see the quadrangular blocks clearly uh, defined in Mexican uh, world and you will see the irregular lines of Havana, Cartagena, without almost nothing to do with the Mexican compost. Uh, so the first thing is that you uh, have not a clear idea 
you are not imposing any idea of what a city should be, at least in America. This can be explained because the publication of the, or the new ordinances of the population and you know, the, the, uh, the, this law was uh, created once uh, that all these cities were already funded by the Spaniards or reorganized by the Spaniards. So maybe they didn't, they hadn't this, uh, this legal framework. But in the Philippines, it, uh, when the Spaniards arrived there uh, with Legazpi, the uh, law was almost published. We have uh, some draft before, so they probably knew about the laws of it. But the thing is that the variety that we find in America is the same that we find in the Philippines. So the thing is that the, 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 the points that are included in the laws of it, which are which are the main, uh, the, the, the characteristic, the, the pattern that we have to follow as a Spaniard, as, in, uh, as empire in the main square are followed in some uh, Philippine cases. But everything which is not included in the laws of English, for example, the Greek, is not followed in most of the Spanish, uh, in most of the Philippine uh, cities, even in Incamusa, as I'm going to uh, show here. And what it is followed is the local uh, feeling, the local taste, which is kept behind this Spanish Greek that has been usually uh, explained. So it is, it is important to know what we have from the Spanish side. It is just summarizing. We have a, a law where more or less uh, the general idea is explained that there is not a lot of detail on, for example, street blocks and all this. And we have a clear idea of how a, a, a village, a city should uh, should be organized with long street uh, parallel to a river or parallel to the sea uh, with distant with houses, which is the usual, uh, in, in a very general perspective, the usual uh, urban organization, not only in the Philippines, but also in other Southeast Asian cases. So we go on with Samboanga, and we had, uh, we have seen a uh, uh, 19th century perspective. And we go uh, to the 19th century. This is a, a, a map of the mid of the century where we see how the new Spanish uh, uh, authorities, the 19th century is a big uh, challenge for the Spanish authorities and many things change, both in the state and in overseas uh, administration, especially after the American independence. Uh, and we see how the military engineers are trying to reorganize the city. And we see in the 19th century, Samboanga, that probably the same story that I'm going to explain for 16th century uh, Manila, Cebu, and other, uh, and other places. We see that we had a local settlement organized in two rows of blocks uh, without crossroads parallel to the sea, and the military engineer tried to impose here, this is true, something like a uh, grid, but on the uh, massive uh, organization. So they are taking many things from, so they are replicating the idea of roads parallel to the sea uh, in the local manner, but with the imposition, this is probably the only imposition by the Spanish side, which is the crossroad. They are trying to incorporate new uh, axes, which are complementary to the B street, which are the usual ones in the uh, in the in the archipelago. This is this was the Samboanga case, and now we are going to see how other cities, which are parallel history in the archipelago, develop. We have a, a, a good case in, in Cebu. We know Cebu first from uh, early description that the plans are really late. These are one of the first, I mean, the, the first where we can see 
uh, the urban layer and we can see how the houses occupy this, uh, this space. I said that uh, Cebu is a, it is an interesting case because even at this late moment in the mid 18th, 19th century, we see that it is true that the, 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 the main squares are organized in the following the, the ideals of the laws of Indies, but the rest is really far from the Spanish way of dealing with urban. For example, uh, if you see the how a Spanish city grew, grew uh, you need to fill every block before creating another one. This is completely different to the Philippine or Malay approach because they are more interested in keeping houses one far from another. So this distance, this um, social distance between different houses is crucial. If you see the uh, the map in Cebu, sorry, uh, yes, uh, you will see that the houses are only at the corners of the uh, of this street. So in fact, they are uh, organizing the uh, the city along streets, keeping houses one far from another. And in, and another important thing is how streets and how blocks are organized. And you will see that they uh, they are very irregular, without any geographical or uh, 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 research. The only explanation here is that they are keeping previous uh, landowners, the, the the previous organization, and they are trying to organize a grid on this previous um, urban organization. We, if we have time, maybe later we can discuss about how the Parian was uh, organized, which is a quite different solution. The uh, uh, urban organization of Cebu is not only known by this previous map, but also by this one, which is slightly later. Uh, we have the same problem and how the city is developing in a very similar way. Well, once we have the idea of how a, 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 a capital, a city, was being developed in uh, from the native settlement to the Spanish, uh, one, we can go to uh, Manila. Of course, Intramuros has a much older representation, and probably uh, it is the only one who is closer to the Spanish laws of it. But even in this case, it is not uh, a the best example of uh, uh, an imperial imposition, and we will see why. Well, uh, it is true that the uh, laws of Indies, one of the things that uh, is clear in the law, is that the main square should be close to the river mouth or close to the sea. So, but this is what the law says. And, well, this is true in Manila, but uh, there are many ways of doing this and nothing said about how the rest of the city should be organized. The grid I speak is not defined in the laws of India. So, uh, if you see we, uh, Manila, it's true that some of, block, some of the blocks are quadrangular, as in the Mexican cases, replicating the measure, the dimensions of the uh, main square. But it is also true that the rest of the blocks, for example, this part, has nothing to do with the uh, with this organization. First, difference. Second one, if you go to other port cities, I'm thinking, for example, in Cartagena, India, in uh, Veracruz, in uh, Havana, you will see that not all of them, almost none of them, has the square where the square is in Manila. First thing. But the most interesting thing is that uh, streets are not parallel to the sea, almost at any of these cases. Uh, the organization of roads from the uh, sea to the hinterland is not as it is organized in Manila. So my interpretation that I'm presenting here now is that if we remember that the original Manila, the original Palisades was uh, where when Velasco arrived in the city, was uh, located in Fort Santiago, in where 
now raised it for Santiago. Uh, we should think that this was the palisade that the city will be organized along the coast, along the beach, uh, in two rows or three rows of, uh, of houses. Uh, this is probably the reason why this main street, which is connecting for Santiago and Bagumbayan Gate, the royal gate, the main gate of Manila, is not exactly parallel to the city because it, I think it is uh, keeping the original urban display of the uh, native settlement. I can say, and we don't have information enough to, to support this, how long this street would be. Uh, probably the Spaniards are just keeping the original orientation of this long street and they are creating the, uh, the, the grid uh, on it. But I would say that this uh, street would be quite longer because after replicating these squared uh, mm, blocks at the beginning, following the, uh, the Mexican uh, pattern, uh, this is not uh, continued here in this San Agustin quarter, we can say, in the, in the surroundings of San Agustin. So I would say that there, there will be several uh, native houses located in this part of the city, uh, making Spaniards to keep long streets without this road. Because it would be very easy and very logic from the usual Spanish way of dealing with these uh, cities to creating a street here in the middle, at least crossing these three blocks. Uh, and this, is, this was not even proposed at this time. Well, <clears throat> this is my quick explanation regarding Intramuros, but we can say something, just something on Chiapo and uh, uh, Chinese quarter. Uh, if we compare the, the, the more or less the Spanish proposal for Intramuros with the urban display outside the walled city, we will see that the blocks and the organization of houses are completely different. We have explained in another presentation, which has been recently published, how the Chinese quarter in Manila uh, followed a uh, urban plan which is repeated in many other uh, Southeast Asian settlements. So the Spaniards did not uh, make that the Chinese community follow the laws of the Indies. And this is another reason to think that they, um, all, they did the same with the local population. If we go to Chiapas, we will see this later uh, with more detail. We will see that Chiapo is not following the Chinese manner nor the, uh, the Spanish one, but something much uh, closer to the, the, what I have explained for uh, Zamboanga or Cebu, and even for Manila. <clears throat> but this is in detail. We will see how block orientation, and even if we know something about how the, the canals and how the potatoes are organized, we can see how Chinese urbanism, uh, European one and native uh, urban planning is living uh, at the same thing. This idea of how uh, rows of houses and blocks uh, are understood by local population can be even uh, can be uh, understood better understood thanks to the strange map of Manila. This is an 18th century map taken by the Spanish authorities uh, from the uh, Sangles community, which were planning to attack Manila at this time. And we see how this round city, it is not regular, but round as uh, the Chinese uh, interpretation of all cities of the time. But the interesting thing, at least for me, is how houses, how streets, are simplified just by five, uh, five or six uh, parallels uh, and without any crossroads. This, the, this is the, the way of understanding the Chinese cities of the of the time, and this is what they represent uh, at this moment. Well, after explaining Manila, we go to the last big capital, which is Bigan, with I think the first time that this plan is uh, 
presented it. Uh, at least uh, I have been discussing this with several scholars working on, on vegan and, and they uh, have not seen it before. Uh, the important for me it is not the publication of the uh, map, but how this map is insisting on the uh, thesis I'm trying to prove. If we, vegan it is a bit, it is quite a rare sample uh, because it is not organized or funded at the mouth of a river or at the seashore, but at, at, uh, uh, in the interior, um, close to the coast, but not in the coast. Uh, but the interesting thing is how the urban planning was organized before the architectural uh, expansion that we can see today in the city, which is a, a very important development. If we see the the, the city in the at the, uh, the at the bottom of, of this image, we see how the the square is uh, uh, organized. This square is not keeping any of the uh, framework that are explained in the laws of Indies, but it is a big space which is being changed during the 18th century, as we know from archival records. But for me, the important thing is how the city is uh, displayed, is uh, organized along the canal with very long streets uh, parallel to this canal and not keeping so clearly the, uh, the, the, this Spanish bridge. If we see only this uh, early 19th century urban development, this is not the usual way that the uh, traditional interpretation of the Spanish bridge would uh, behave. So we are we have we can see this in Vigan, but if you go if you, if you use this same map to see how the the, the breadth of barrios, the breadth of uh, visitas are organized, you will see that houses are always organized uh, flanking uh, a long street. Uh, which is usually parallel to uh, a coast or uh, a riverside. So, uh, mm, local towns are organized following native manner, and this is not bad or rare for Spanish authorities, but for me, the interesting thing is that even big capitals are following or are keeping this uh, urban planning behind the general image that this is an Spanish uh, city. If we go to Piapo, this is a detail that is better known by scholars, but we see that, again, uh, the, even the organization of the main square is not following the ideals of the laws of Indies, but uh, they are keeping the mollet, because this is densely uh, uh, inhabited and they require space, but they are keeping the ideals of the Indies. The Indian people who are living here, and not the uh, imposition of any empire coming from abroad. They are uh, organizing all this space from this perspective. This can be seen in Chiapo, but can be also found in many, many other cases uh, in different parts of the architecture. I, I have just chosen several examples thanks to. Uh, rare maps that are still preserved here in, in Spain. And we can see here uh, a, a good number of uh, little towns uh, around uh, Buhi Labun, Obato Labun today. And we can see that the, the important thing here is not the grid, but the path, the street, the road, which usually organize the uh, entire uh, space. If we see these details, we see that the important here is how the road is organized. We can see little visitas where the, the number of houses are lower. So we see how is the, the first step of these uh, urban uh, villages. And we see how big, bigger uh, cases, how they replicate the same idea, just including some crossroads and including something close to a uh, main square with the church. So the only things that are uh, incorporated by Spaniards are the, the, the atrio, the square uh, in the front of the church, and incorporated
operating properly, which is probably part of uh, uh, the incorporation of new uh, transport and new requirements in transportation and traffic, much more than an imperial or a visual rhetoric uh, as has been usually explained. Finally, uh, I give here uh, 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 a new case. These are um, much later sources, but we can see the same problem. Yeah, I have uh, chosen this example because they are uh, interesting how the, uh, the development of the, we can see at the, uh, at the left, how all houses are organized crossing the this road. And this is probably the original way of dealing with this and finally we have the, the little village which is organized in very few blocks and not following the, the usual uh, grid we can discuss further on this on this thing well uh, as i have said this is a very visual uh, interpretation of uh, of sources and i'm very interested in discussing uh, my interpretations with you I'm very happy of sharing my uh, my studies with uh, with my colleagues in the archipelago. Uh, I I'm very happy of, of doing. Uh, although I would like to be there with you, so thank you very much. Marni Salamat, muchas gracias. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Rango, for the, the very visual presentation. It's fascinating, and I have a lot of questions. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to open the floor for uh, a Q&A uh, for our audience and for me as well. And Zoom attendees uh, may use the chat or the Q&A function to send us your questions. Uh, and for, uh, so uh, we, can, we can begin this now and uh, uh, we will uh, proceed. <laughs> Uh, while we wait for our uh, Zoom attendees to uh, write out their questions, uh, I have a couple of questions of my own. And I noticed that uh, there's a very interesting intersection between the two uh, presentations, wherein you have social interaction, and that social interaction is uh, one of the mediums of that social interaction is the uh, uh, exchanging of the battle plan. And uh, the form of urban organization is itself a, a, a structural uh, manifestation of the social interaction. You see them lining the coasts, you see them lining the roads, so I expect it has something to do with mobility, you know, movement from place to place, interacting with one another that leads to how they settle in a particular pattern. Um, so uh, I have a, a couple of questions, uh, one for uh, each of our presenters. Um, for Professor Daoud, I was wondering, uh, you've identified particular sentiments and particular practices that uh, manifest those sentiments and particular products that those practices make use of. Uh, you focused on the, the betel nut. Uh, I wonder uh, what other uh, objects from the 16th century uh, could be used to talk about the ways in which uh, Southeast Asians and Filipinos in particular interacted with each other, number one. And why did you pick the betel nut uh, in particular, number two? And um, for Professor Loengo, I, I, uh, I, I was really interested in, in, in your presentation because it uh, really changes the point of view of, uh, of how we imagine um, settlements to be structured during the colonial era, we usually expect them to be in that grid pattern. And you showed that for a number of major cities in, in Vigan, in Cebu, in Manila, that that was really not the case, uh, especially for the communities who are living, um, the, the indigenous communities rather than the Spanish communities and for the Chinese as well. So what I was wondering is, um, for the if it was not required by the, the Leyes de Indias, when it, when settlements did adopt uh, a grid pattern, such as Lukban, I think, uh, is in that grid pattern, why did they do it? Okay, so those are my two questions. Either speaker, you can begin. Okay, uh, I'll start because someone is also asking in chat uh, something similar. Uh, well, uh, there's no particular 
you know, something grand explanation as to why I picked betel nut or, or uh, betel quid chewing. Uh, it started as an assignment in a class that I had many years ago. And uh, it got deep. Like, I wasn't really expecting it. My, my curiosity back then was every time I asked them uh, why they usually chew. Because ever since I encountered the Higa Odom, uh, been to their places, they usually do it. And there are red uh, marks of spit. Uh, in the ground, in the house, in everything, and I, I started asking them why. Uh, why do you do it? And then they always tell me ginagawa. Now at that time, I was thinking, well, ginagawa is a concept, and it was a concept about love, but uh, I did not see any relation with it uh, until I started asking and, and, and there, you know, and then uh, out of that, I started searching for. Uh, better liquid chewing in Southeast Asia. Uh, as I said, there are many websites about it. Problem is, it's talking about uh, leading to cancer and leading to uh, some kind of uh, diseases. Uh, but that's also the the point of relating to the one asking in chat. Um, the, 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 it's not limited within, uh, well, at first, uh, I know it's not limited within uh, Iligan because uh, the Maranao, for example, are also doing it. And then I started checking out uh, Baron Robertson, which is just basic uh, info, and then started looking at, oh, the Spaniards are in it as well. And then I started looking uh, for a documentary about betel quid chewing, and then I saw betel quid chewing in India, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Thailand, and I was like, oh, it's all over the place. So what was going on, and then that's how I ended up with that story that somehow would remind me what I saw with the Higaolan because in the end, Ginagawa is about love, and then the story is also about love, albeit in a kind of different sort, but the idea of both ended up as universal, as part of tradition, that love is no longer that, that love that those three showed in the story is, is now about tradition, it's now about uh, creating links with everyone, and that's also what I saw with the Gaon. So that that's how I ended up with metal quid chewing. Now, regarding the first question, no, I haven't. Like honestly, I haven't thought of that uh, about other material, part of material culture in Southeast Asia that would somewhat be in line with this specific style, wherein through this material culture we can see the the social links that were developed and whether or not the social links are. Uh, similar either in the Philippines in, or in the neighboring countries. Right? It's actually a good question because I, I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't thought of it. The first thing that came to mind was alcohol, right? Because we, uh, we use that also for social interaction. Yeah, yeah Kuba. Yeah. Um, Professor Luengo? Yes, well, I, I'm trying to, to take your uh, question with something that I'm more or less reading in the, in the, in the chat. Um, last time I met uh, Professor Xi was in a conference uh, titled Returning to the Region. And I think, at least for me, it was a very important point. And I think this is not, well, this, this conference is, and well, this team uh, are, uh, is trying to change at least the approach to Philippine history because many Spanish scholars, I should say, Dino Stras, a Spaniard, maybe have been trying to uh, write a Spanish history of the Philippine archipelago, which is, at, uh, at the end, a way of putting out uh, the Philippines from the region. Uh, I'm really happy with the presentation of my colleague, uh, Dao, because you are creating, and we, I think some of us are trying to create connections of what we can find in the Philippines and connect it with other, other parts of the, of the Southeast Asian territory, uh, with or without the uh, European contribution. So uh, this is uh, important also for our architectural and urban practices. Uh, coming back to the grid, the, um, the, the, the question which was uh, why they follow or why they were interested in, in this in this tweet. Uh, first we should say that um, in all 
both cases, I mean, American and Saudi Arabian cases, uh, the use of tweet is first interpretation uh, of law, and this should be a local interpretation because it has no sense that a person who is found in, in Mexico and found in Manila is considering different orders of tweet. Uh, uh, it is true that there is some uh, from the funny side. I think that Spaniards were trying to keep somehow the image of the original account, but not in a in imperial equation trying to you know impose to the native population the idea it had in mind. Maybe a other colonial powers are trying to do in other parts of the world. But just um, as a reminder of what my uh, my account think, uh, looked like. This is, um, for example, this is the reason I think that can explain some blogs in Manila which are copying the Mexican, not so clearly the, the, the Spanish way. But uh, maybe this is an historiographic um, tendency from, from my side, but I would say that the explanation that why they use it, it is um, a very practical way. Uh, if you have uh, a street, it's a connection between two points. So, from the traffic perspective, from consumption uh, perspective of uh, the tourist uh, to the arrival to the Spanish, you have a way of dealing with commerce which is different to the early modern one. And you need something more fluid, a, a, a more um, Easy way of uh, working inside the cities with different connections. So you need a square where you or will organize commerce, and you need easy connection between the square and different gates of the city. So this is a a, a new way of dealing with space, which is practical for commercial uh, aspect, and not only for Spaniards, which are interested in this, but also for local population. So that, again, this is a, an interpretation on the interpretation on the interpretation, and any philosopher working with me would say that this is too much. So <laughs> I will keep only in the urban uh, analysis. So I guess uh, the interpretation of the interpretation is that it's a, a rationalization of space between two points that was a suggestion Sometimes it was taken, but sometimes it was not followed. This, this seems to be the case. Thank you. Um, so we've got two questions, one from the chat and one from the Q&A. Both of them are present oriented, uh, but should be interesting to answer as well. Uh, so one question is uh, for Prof. Daoud, and the question is, is battle not addictive? Uh, you, and you mentioned a little bit about this, of people who cannot live without it. and. So our, our, uh, our attendee is asking, just like smoking is a form of leisure, some say it makes your teeth stronger, but others say it might have um, negative health issues. So could you explore a little uh, about that? And for Professor Luengo, the, the question has to do with um, stages of urban planning. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, do settlements at the time did settlements, so we're talking in the, of the 16th century here, were, how far into the future were they looking? Um, did the laws specify development over time? So these are interesting questions. Uh, we'd like to hear your answers. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it is addictive. Um, I actually brought this one up uh, in some of my interviews with the uh, tribal leaders and uh, they usually just smile about it and I told them about cancer and then you know, some illnesses and then they would say, well, if that's true, well, why are we still here? It's, it's usually how they frame it. And uh, yes, it is addictive. I, I tried it and I, um, I, I saw how it is appealing. It, it can make you feel good, uh, uh, although they did not let me try with a tobacco. Uh, but I'm pretty sure with a Tobago that would more like intensify the sensation. Yeah. I thought you were going to say, I tried it and now I'm addicted. But okay, Professor Loengo? 
Yes, well, uh, great question. Uh, yes, the, the ideal, the Spanish ideal was preferred for growing as, as far as you want. Uh, because you are creating the center with a main square and you can replicate block farther away. But uh, this is not the way that most of the cities grew in the Philippines. So uh, again, I think that the power of local taste of organizing things along street, along roads, uh, was maintained. And the idea of the um, little village developed from a center to the outskirts, uh, well, it was very complicated from Manila to vegan. It was almost impossible to, to do it. Uh, so, but this, uh, from my perspective as a Spanish scholar is that this was not followed in the Philippines because the Philippines has a different context, but this was not followed in Mexico because Mexico is a different context. And you can follow this in any part of the world, even in Spain. So this is a, an idea which is in the law that was not followed almost never. <laughs> so this is, a, 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 this is an exaggeration that, well, it is the, I think we shouldn't say at the beginning of any paper dealing with urban planning in Spanish there is this saying, this is thanks to the law of society. Well, uh, I, I can see in most of things. Interesting. So we see how uh, there is really a, a difference between the policies and what the policies are trying to change, what the policies are trying to do, and it doesn't not necessarily um, translate into how cities are actually planned. Okay. Nothing, um, nothing new. <laughs> today. Uh, we, we, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit, um, sometimes we forget that when we, when we talk about Philippine history and we, we tend to talk about, um, the, the archival materials as if, uh, what is written on the paper is what actually happened. And sometimes we forget that, that oh, actually, Sometimes these are just these are just words; they don't really translate. Um, there are two more questions, both for Professor Loengo. Um, one of them is uh, both from anonymous attendees, um, and one is asking if you would be happy, if you would be willing to share with us um, uh, uh, an image of a Spanish settlement uh, to see what what you mean when they the Philippine settlements kind of looked like the Spanish settlements in terms of um following or not following urban planning uh the question uh, before that uh has to do with um with the pandemic and and i think the the general um question here has to do with were cities ever organized to address disease and the spread of disease now, we know from the book, for instance, of Warwick Anderson, that this was done very much uh, by the Spanish colonial government. But were thoughts like this on um, control of epidemics uh, also enacted uh, in the Spanish colonial era? And how early? Well, I, I'm, I'm looking for the... Uh, uh, the image I'm going to, I'm trying to share with you know well i will do in a different way i'm sharing with you this this is what uh one of the uh, this is part of my classes that well the, maybe it is important for you uh the usual the ideal case that they are trying to copy is santa fe this is not santa fe this one is santa fe so you can see the main square here with a main street. This is true what you usually do. Uh, we usually have a main street, although this is more Portuguese than Spaniard. And then you have the blocks. This is uh, the ideal uh, city uh, which Spaniards are trying to do in the um, in in this moment in the 16th century. Because if we go to uh, I'm I'm showing you uh, well maybe. Yes, if we see how Seville was, well, these are tiny ones, but if you see uh, how an old city, an old capital in, in Spain was when Legazpi arrived, they had Santa Cruz in mind, but what we, what they had, they knew was Muslim cities with tiny streets, 
uh, without any grid anywhere. And uh, so this is something that they are trying to copy uh, and in Santa Fe trying to remember the Roman uh, Empire organization, what the classical uh, empire was, uh, was successful thanks to these cities. Um, so uh, this is what they were trying to, to copy somehow. I don't remember the second question, sorry. The, the second question had to be, uh, had to do with uh, organization of cities uh, in relation to disease. Uh, we know it was during the American era, was it done also much earlier? Okay, uh, well, um, if we go to the 16th century, they have very few elements regarding disease or well-being in the city, uh, may, mainly around the, the orientation of streets regarding winds and heat and thermal aspects. Uh, again, repeating the Roman architectural theory, uh, but this was not followed at any moment. Uh, the problem with disease arrived in the 18th century, 18th, 19th century, when they are thinking on where to locate cemeteries, uh, hospitals, what to do with water, uh, and all these hygienist uh, aspects that are arriving in, the, in Manila in the late 18th century. And from that moment, there are many urban changes incorporating, uh, for example, gardens, uh, more courtyards, um, more spaces where the, the city are facing disease in a different manner. For example, they are creating the hospitals outside the city, which was not the way uh, Manila in the 16th century, by the way, well, uh, it has it had two or three hospitals apart from numerous infirmaries. All these aspects are put outside during the 18th century. Something else uh, that I read here in the chat um, about the the relationship between urban planning and fortification. Remember that Manila is the only fortified city in the Philippines. You do have fortifications, but not walled cities, which is completely different. And uh, in fact, Manila is a rare example of, of walled cities in the Spanish Empire, a very rare case. Uh, you have uh, Cartagena, uh, Havana, but for example, if you see most of Mexican cities are not for, uh, walled. Uh, even Mexico City is planned to be walled in the late 18th century and many many cities were never uh, i say walls not fortified all of them were fortified but not walls which is from the urban perspective completely different interesting interesting um both the uh, the comparison between empires that uh, spain is uh, keeping in mind the references to rome okay um, as well as uh, the discussion on, on these fortifications, I didn't know that um, a lot of them were not uh, not walled. Um, but for Professor Dalog, I, I have a question of my own. Um, that uh, um, which had to do with because uh, ah, you mentioned that to fail to offer uh, betel nut would be an insult to whoever uh, person that you have in your company. Um, so does that, does that caution that, um, that norm, was it ever used as an insult? Do you, uh, do you have like examples, uh, from, from whether from oral history or the, the sources where someone will go out of their way to insult someone by, by, with, by withholding battle now? Uh, that was actually, um, uh... An ethnography from William Henry Scott uh, from the people in Cebu, but it's actually quite similar with what can actually happen in the Higaon tradition because uh, it, it's the the, the betel nut uh, is actually considered um, sacred. The betel quid is actually considered sacred, and if uh, you refuse it uh, here you get cursed. That's 
kind of like the thing. Like if something sacred is offered to you and you refuse it, there's a tendency that people would believe that oh, it's, it's unacceptable. But the one that was mentioned by William Henry Scott, I'm not very familiar. In fact, when I was uh, uh, reading about it, the act, he actually mentioned something about upa, which is something sexual uh, in Cebuano, and uh, kind of like related because it, in his study, it 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 was related to seduction, like uh, if if you share a uh, um, a, a better quid that you already chew and then offer it, and if the woman would accept it, that that would be that. Uh, your seduction was accepted and kung uh, sabisaya pa, let me speak the vernacular, kung uh, sabisaya pa, marala ka pa upa, you are inviting the person to a kind of sexual um, activity. And I suppose knowing those norms, if you're offered and you're not interested, then you would, you would say no, you would refuse to, to eat it. Huh? That would probably be an insult. Oh, as as far as I can I can tell here, uh, if somebody offers you and you won't accept, like me, they would not offer me most of the time because they know that I'm not from the group. But uh, in their group, if they would offer, it's like you're obliged to to accept. And most of the time I've seen, it's not even a case of you offering, it's more like some guy would just, can I have some? Uh, th that's usually what I observe. But I just don't know in the Visayan tradition because uh, when when I was in the Visayas, I haven't seen people doing it anymore. Interesting. Um, may I also know if um, the the production and consumption of betel nut are these local practices or would I mean would you trade betel nut with another settlement, gather it here, sell it there? Uh, here in the Higa Olan, they used to have, well, they still have their uh, areca tree and betel nut, uh, but the lime uh, is usually produced already in the uh, in the plains. Uh, some of them would uh, buy it from from producers. So, but regarding whether or not the clans would have a kind of division of labor, where you in charge of this while we uh, no, they, they never had something like that. Interesting, interesting. So it's largely you produce your own, except for certain ingredients. So it makes it a very personal offering. Huh? Interesting. Um, okay, uh, we have a further question for um, uh, for uh, Professor Luengo about uh, the Pueblo system. Um, Jan Casco asks, in the urbanization of the Philippines, the Spaniards also introduced the Puebla system that is still visible till today. Is it also similar to urban planning in Spain? Um, and in addition to this, I'd like to ask for a definition of the Pueblo. Um, uh, <laughs> it's the people, it's the town, is it a municipality? How would you define it? Well, uh, important question here because I, I have been speaking mainly about cities or something a bit bigger. Uh, the, the laws of Indies uh, give uh, an explanation or, or try to support um, a local organization, but they, my opinion is that they were thinking mainly on taxes, on organization of the population to, to, to know how many people they were there uh, and how they should pay the, uh, the taxes. If you have people living everywhere, you, it is it's complicated to, to, to organize this in, in, in an administrative term, but in tax term. So what they try to do both in America and the Philippines were try to put people in little boxes, in little spaces, which are the pueblos. Uh, the idea of what a pueblo is, a town is, is of course in Spain, you can find it, but not with the same intention. This is, uh, in Spain you have a town which is a little city, and a city which is a big town. So it is just uh, uh, the same thing with different dimensions. 
in in the, in America and the Philippines, I think there is a difference. The capitals are the places where the Spanish administration is organized, and the local population is organized in the in the provinces through this uh, point. Interesting thing in the Philippines is that this development was not uh, directed by the Spanish authorities because there were very few people in their terminal. So the Pueblo's organization is not, in most of cases, is not done, made by um, encomenderos, but by friars. For this reason, uh, if you see the uh, Philippine Pueblo, you see that in the middle you have a convent. Most of cases you don't have a, a, a local administration building. You don't have a, a, an ayuntamiento. Most of them are 19th century ones and they're very rare in the Philippines. If you go to other American countries, you see that you have a main square as it is described in the Los of Indies with a church, usually a parish, not a convent. I know that there it is a bit complicated, it's different, but you have a parish and a local administration or a regional one at the same as, as you can see in, in Manila. But this is not the case in the Philippines. In the Philippines, you have a convent with a big atrio, and this atrio is inside a big, uh, uh, a, big um, uh, a, uh, a big square, usually with a tree. And I'm, I don't want to to go further with this. That you have a tree, a tree in a tree in the middle, uh, and um, that I have explained in the, in the past how important these trees were for local population, because this is the place where the the, the, the native population organized the community. Uh, the, even, even the judgment and many things around the big tree in the middle of this space. Uh, and they, the, the, the Spanish friar kept and uh, took these uh, trees with another meaning and put them in the, in the quarter of the, of the church. Of course, what they did is building the church uh, uh, near the tree, not, not changing the tree of where it was. But well, this is the, the idea. Sorry for, for explaining maybe too many things. No, no, it's very interesting. And you mentioned uh, priests uh, organizing pueblos, and I assume that they're also doing a lot of the urban planning. Did they have a lot of background in urban planning? I assume this wasn't a course in the seminary. Yes, thank you, because the, I'm coming back to what I have said. Uh, Philippine, History is full of friars doing everything. Uh, if we go in detail, uh, I, I'm Catholic, so I'm not uh, fighting against the church. Uh, but um, friars were single person with many attitudes that they had important things to do and not to organize what it was already organized. So if you see the pueblos, the pueblos were organized, and they the only thing they wanted is creating a religious space in the middle. Uh, so they were focused on finding builders, local builders, to do the, the church. I'm, I, I cannot understand the idea of a friar uh, deciding how to organize the, the village. The village was organized or was being organized by local population of there. Um, uh, so probably he, uh, he probably they were main. Uh, he um, proposed something closer to his own experience in America and Europe. But again, I'm I have very few cases of friars that were known in Spain because of their urban training. So my impression is that they will say almost nothing. Interesting. So we tend to assume that the friar makes all the decisions, and maybe they want us to assume that they make all the decisions, but in actuality, they rely on the local community to make these choices. Yes. Interesting. Okay. So uh, we are uh, coming to the end of our, our, um, our panel presentation. Um, uh, final questions from the audience, if anyone wants to uh, uh, ask any questions, whether in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, okay. 
Okay, it seems that we have completed the list on the Q&A uh, as well as on the chat. Well, uh, in which case, uh, we've had a, a very interesting um, conversation today about uh, social practices and social organization and the forms that it takes and the people involved in it. So thank you to both our presenters. Um, and we are end, we're going to end the, this panel of session six of the PIQC, uh, PIQC, yes, Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. Uh, it is now 2.50 Philippine standard, standard Time. We invite everyone to catch uh, the next session um, of the PIQC. Uh, and you can um, uh, you can also watch the recordings of these presentations as made available by the NQC. Um, again, the, uh, our speakers have been uh, Professor Pedro Luengo and Professor Archil Daoub. Thank you to you both. And I have been Nicholas C., uh, uh, your moderator. Thank you to everyone and have a good day. Um, uh, we now uh, wait for a cue from our technical director, uh, but the presentation itself is completed. Thanks, everyone.